Welcome to the Future State of Business, presented by Samsung Insights. I'm Andrea Raines from the Samsung Mobile B2B team. Each episode, our head of Mobile B2B, Tahir Bebahani, and I will sit down with industry experts to discuss what's next in enterprise, education, healthcare, and more. On this episode, we're joined by Momar Dieng, a World Bank advisor on global education policy and an instructor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. We discuss how the COVID-19 crisis is reshaping education around the globe, ways to bridge the digital divide and evolve technology for virtual learning, and how public and private sectors can move education out of the industrial era and into the future. Today, I have a pleasure of uh, talking to Mama Ding, uh, who is uh, a World Bank advisor uh, on ed- global education policy and an instructor at Harvard's uh, Kennedy School. Um, he's actually been kind enough to join us from uh, Dakar, Senegal. So it's really a pleasure to m- meet you remotely and discuss education and challenges in that very important area, not only in the US, but of course, globally. But here, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, part of this series. Mamar, as, as you have been uh, looking in the schools and education, and when this whole situation with the pandemic began, what do you think was the biggest challenge that uh, school is, uh, and institutions faced when trying to decide how to approach this new whole situation? I think one of the things that's been hardest for schools was gauging probably teachers and families' preparedness to support uh, digital learning um, and just how much work all of this was really going to entail. Uh, for instance, on the teacher side, even before COVID um, came into the picture, um, uh, research showed that uh, even teachers who worked hard to integrate technology still lost up to one third of uh, instructional time figuring out just how to make technology work for them in real time in the classroom. Um, And beyond the mechanics of use of technology, there's also the deeper question of instructional design. Um, Great in-person teaching does not always translate to great remote online instruction. Uh, I've I've rediscovered this uh, myself as I started teaching online this summer. Uh, Despite all of the wonderful help I I got from support staff and and colleagues at, at Harvard, Um, It's just the fact that the online environment requires um, careful thinking um, uh, on the use of class time, uh, on the the props and tools that are best suited. Um, I found myself experimenting with the uses and misuses of the the Zoom breakout room, for instance, uh, or, you know, pondering how to best conduct um, office hours online or how to handle uh, questions on screen while the live chat window was uh, teeming with more questions and comments on the side. Uh, So all these things are things that um, usually require retraining and time for internalizing and personalization uh, before they can fall into place in a a teacher's workflow. So uh, those are some of the examples of, of the struggles on the teacher side of things. Now on the family side, I think many schools are still struggling with how to support uh, parental engagement uh, so that parents can play the ever more crucial support role in this new learning from home uh, setting that that we are that we've been thrusted in uh, things like how to foster effective two-way communication uh, between school and home are still works in progress for most um, if not uh, for many if not most schools um, so these are the things uh, many of us have talked about and written about um, in theory, but when it came to applying them in practice at scale in this grand natural experiment that, that COVID has created, it hasn't been that easy. That's really interesting. Um, it's true because, uh, you know, st- uh, students had to become digital experts. And uh, you can argue students usually are the digital experts in families and schools, right. right? They know more than they're probably more advanced by a generation or two at least. We know that. But then teachers had to catch up. Right. And then, and then the families had to catch up. I would say education is probably the hidden gem in this whole new, uh, I, would, I would call the phase of uh, innovation in all of this new technology and the mode of technology. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think that uh, we are really at a, at a turning point um, and how to make education work in this new world is 
is both a challenge, but a, a very exciting one, a very exciting prospect. And it, like you said, it's a hidden gem. I think that's, those are uh, the best words to describe it. And you know, as I, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm actually um, seeing a, I would say a massive amount, amount of hope and joy because this learning would be very important for all of us and our countries and societies after all of this is over, hopefully soon, because uh, the, this will remain, right? It will um, level the playing field in terms of education in many different areas. Absolutely. You know, um, before COVID came into the picture, education theorists have been lamenting about how education is the hardest thing to change in any government, in any society, and we're still teaching to the industrial age and thinking of schools as factories. And, and what COVID has done is basically completely shaken up that whole uh, paradigm, right? And forced us to, uh, to, to, to do in, in, a span, in a span of six months what in the past 200 years, uh, really educationalists have struggled to do, which is question everything and put everything uh, on the table and, and rediscover or re-question uh, some of the basic assumptions. Well, so one of the things that we have seen in the US was, um the the massive spike in demand for uh, devices because you have to be connected. So you know, just to give you an example, in in a very short period of time, you know, year basically we saw about 150 time you know demand increase uh, uh, in terms of our our Chromebooks, our, our tablets. The demand for tablets have grown in, just exponentially. And, and supplies are limited. So right. what are the learnings or the advice you would have, not only for the school districts in the US, but also more broadly internationally, on, on optimizing the, the number of devices per school, per family? How do we do this? How does this, what's the calculus behind it from your perspective? Uh, well, so this, is, uh, this is one of the, the, the great challenges, right, of this crisis. And uh, what it has done is it has propelled uh, online learning from something that's nice to have, some, you know, something extracurricular to becoming basically the lifeline in all of these education systems. Um, and uh, now we have to start thinking of ed tech and digital technology uh, as more than a stopgap solution. And as you pointed out, one of the, the um, uh, stumbling blocks, um, uh, one of the, the pain points is really devices. So in the US, uh, you have this issue of, of um, shortage of Chromebooks and, and laptops. And I think that there, I feel that the, the shortage is somewhat artificial because there are so many more options. So when I talk to school districts, I encourage them to think of other ways that students could be connected. I mean, at the end of the day, um, many tablets are uh, you know, powerful enough and offer enough features for students to do, I would say, 90% of the things that they would do on, on a laptop. So it doesn't need to be a laptop necessarily. Um, uh, you know, if you are just following courses um, or videos on, on, uh, on an, a teleconferencing platform, you actually could do it on your cell phone. And there have been reports that many of the students who couldn't get their hands on a laptop for the beginning of this, uh, this academic year have started using their cell phone in a much more active and much more innovative way that, than, than we could think of. Um, and so I think that in, in the case of the US, there are solutions that can be put in place both on the side of um, uh, suppliers and, and school districts, but we also have to be just more uh, open-minded in terms of what a device can be and, and how different types of devices can allow us to access resources. Now, if I, if I go to other parts of the world, let's say Senegal, where I am right now, uh, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, the issues are, I think, more serious and, and more difficult to resolve because we, the, the resources are not even there in terms of fiscal space and budgetary space. You know, most, of most of the governments in Sub-Saharan Africa cannot even afford to have a stimulus package of the kind the US government um, has, has been doling out. Um, and so the resources are extremely limited here and we have to be thinking of different ways to use technology and maybe low tech ways of, uh, of uh, approaching the problem using things like SMS, using things like just uh, simple phone calls. I just read a, a randomized trial, um, uh, a, a paper on a randomized trial experiment in, in Botswana recently 
uh, that showed significant gain if uh, students were just uh, students and families were were just uh, motivated to follow up on on their learning using simple phone calls. So these are behavioral uh, interventions that are very low tech and can also have a big impact. That's really interesting. Let's talk about this idea of access um, and having access to internet. So. What do you think happens when a certain group or a certain part of the society has access and a certain group of the society does not? How do we uh, cross that barrier? Should it be a, a government program? Should it be a, uh, a, a technology program? Should it be a combination of private public sector? How does one approach it from a policy point of view? I think that uh, there are stages in, in the response. I think that the, the, in the very short term, it would have to be a public policy response, a government response. Uh, as I uh, uh, pointed out earlier, I think that, you know, in terms of supplying or, or um, uh, yeah, in terms of supplying access to, to uh, low income communities, to, to internet and onto public Wi-Fi in the very short term, that's something that government and local government in particular is best uh, suited to do. So. I would love to see some of that stimulus money that people are talking about uh, right now be directed to initiatives of, of that sort. Now, in the medium to long term, I think that industry definitely has a role to play. Um, and uh, this may be one of those areas where we see some of that relearning from, um, uh, from developing countries and, and applying that in, in, in more advanced countries. For instance, in developing countries, it's commonplace uh, to use um, uh, mobile data for everything, right? Um, and to have devices that primarily function uh, on mobile data uh, with um, uh, mobile data enabled SIM cards and things like that, even laptops, right? Um, or laptops with, with um, USB keys that can, can connect to, to mobile internet that way. That's not something that you see much of in, in a country like the US, but in rural areas, for instance, in the US, this could be something uh, that is reintroduced in order to give access to students who are not uh, in a coverage area of, of uh, any, you know, Wi-Fi or uh, uh, broadband um, internet access at home. So that technology um, aspect would involve making sure that devices are somewhat autonomous when it comes to connecting to the internet and, and making sure that that is seamless and and, and that they don't have to, to the students don't really have to think about it uh, in the way that you mentioned with, uh, with some of the, the, the work that Samsung is doing, making uh, devices uh, be able to transform into, into tablets, into Chromebooks in, in sort of a one-click uh, type of way. So we need the same kind of um, a simple to use solution for access when you infuse or integrate the elements of technology, do you think that in the, in the next few years, students will have to take few courses in person, few lab work if they're in you know, more higher education, and then they can actually finish or complete a portion of their education online and be certified? Do you think that's gonna happen? That's, that's one of the things I'm really excited about, um, making learning into small bite-sized pieces that people can get certified for, can get credentials for. Uh, recently, some of the, uh, the players in the ed tech, uh, in, the, in the technology space, have actually introduced uh, certifications that you can uh, finish in, in six months, in a couple of months, and build a college degree that way, uh, a couple of months at a time, or one certification at a time. And I think that's the future of education. And it would give so much freedom uh, to students all over the world, and in particular, uh, students in the US, not to be tied anymore to this uh, sort of older, again, industrial age model of a four-year college education. What makes you optimistic as you look forward, uh, you know, from the education perspective, and, and, and you know, to share with me some of the, if, if the, your vision and your, your dreams actually from the, for the space. You know, I'm extremely excited that, for instance, there is newfound public recognition for how essential schools are in society. And that came a little bit the hard way. You know, parents like, uh, like me have really gotten to appreciate what a, what a teacher really does with their kids when they've had to do it at home <laughs> on a 24 hour basis. So there's this this newfound understanding of what education is, the importance of education, and an appreciation for uh, professionals in the field of education. And I think that 
uh, that um, newfound uh, appreciation now can be leveraged to solve some of the problems uh, that we have and to introduce innovations and to uh, really put school at the, at the center of, of an ecosystem, really, that, that in, involves many, many players in, in, in society, uh, be it the, the tech companies, uh, you know, local government or other, other stakeholders. Um, the other thing that I'm really excited about is, and you mentioned that earlier when you were talking about whether you'd be able to see me in, in 3D soon. Um, there is, I think, this part of EdTech that was introduced maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, that companies like Samsung are, are leaders in, uh, which is virtual reality. And before COVID, I felt like virtual reality was a missed opportunity because it hadn't really been pushed uh, to where it, it, it could have gone in terms of providing solutions for education. And I think that there's a renewed interest in, in really looking at how VR can, uh, for instance, create science labs all over the world and give students uh, experiences that they couldn't even have imagined before, you know, looking inside an atom or inside a, um, uh, a DNA or inside a, a, a human cell and, and giving, um, and I'm particularly uh, passionate about this, the STEM, the science aspect of it, because I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm a mathematician myself. So I, I feel that this is one of the areas where this new um, uh, energy that we have in, in terms of looking at how to, to um, digitize things and how to virtualize things would result in, in really amazing advances that will make education into something very different from, from what it is right now and allow students a whole range of new experiences that, that we couldn't have imagined before. And in the process, um, create the new Einsteins and, and, and the, new, um, uh, you know, the new advances that, that we badly need in, in certain fields. That's fantastic. And of course, we need many more of those to That's help right. the world in many different ways. Uh, but this is one area that I think there's a lot of hope uh, for our, the next generation and the new generation and everything that we can do to help uh, help not only on a local basis, but on a global basis. The learnings are fantastic. I'm really grateful to you. This has been very enlightening and uh, extremely uh, uplifting. Uh, thank you for joining us from Senegal it's, uh, and taking the time. It's really a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, I, I'm, I'm really glad for your insightful questions and, and comments. It's, it's been a pleasure. You've been listening to The Future State of Business, presented by Samsung Insights. Thanks again to Momar Dieng for joining us. To learn more, visit the links in the episode description. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. You can also follow us on Twitter at SamsungBizUSA and on LinkedIn at Samsung Electronics America to find out more about upcoming episodes.